I did it, guys. I made Maria read The Savior's Sister, but it may have cost our friendship. Never talk to me again. Okay, guys, as I said in the cold open, we did read The Savior's Sister. I did sort of force Maria to do it, but it's good. You guys should know that I equally regret reading it as she did. For those who aren't aware, Maria is my lovely co-host. Hi, guys. How are you doing today? And uh, this was much requested from our Savior's Champion video. We actually weren't planning on reading the sequel, um, but we did and we regret it immensely. The book is somehow much worse than the Savior's Champion. So I'd like to apologize. I'd like to issue this channel's formal apology to the Savior's Champion because in retrospect, we had it so good and the thing is one of our commenters on our video was literally like i didn't like savior's champion but savior's sister was better the writing was better the plot was more engaging and like i can see why someone would think that but for me nah -uh, i would much <laughs> rather go back to my days of reading the savior's champion and i i would prefer that like if i had to reread one of these which reading one is basically reading the other one just Whose head are you in? I would pick Tobias's head any day. We were such sweet summer children. Oh no idea God. of what was to I come. Was ignorant. The brutal winter of the Donner Party to come. The thing about the book is that structurally speaking, The Savior's Champion was a simple story. So it had a lot of the advantages of a simple story that goes from A to B. And you just tell it. There's an overarching plot, a question of what's going to happen to Tobias in this tournament. The Savior Sister has the problem that it's half the story of the competitors in the tournament and half Layla just doing random political things that don't super make sense. And the two do not fit together. It, we'll talk about it more as we go because structurally you have to see how it works, but it really does not work well. It's interesting because I think what we've said is that in The Savior's Champion, certain things that you thought were like, okay, that seems a little dumb, but I'm sure it's off. It's happening off screen. I'm sure there's something kind of making sense there. We see in this book, it happened on screen and we see that it makes less sense less than sense. we thought possible. And in some cases, no explanation would have been the best explanation. <laughs> and first off, before we get too hard into it, like one thing that I think needs to be said is if you enjoy this book, nothing we say will make you unenjoy this book, and that is okay. I have loved books that other people have really disliked or thought were objectively bad or wouldn't have finished. Again, I will carry this forever. Will wouldn't have finished Spinning Silver, one of my all-time favorite books. And so just because we, like, are gonna you know, go at this book. Brutalize. And, and pick it apart. We are not coming for your feelings on this book. This is how we interacted with this book as, it, like, every book that I've ever loved has a staunch following of, like, one-star reviews that savage it, you know? And I think in this case, it's kind of interesting because if you like this book, you should already know all the problems with it that we're going to mention it not working. And if those things on a uh, visceral level worked for you, then us explaining why they don't work aren't gonna affect you. It's it's a, yeah. a little bit different than other bad books I've read in that way, in that the problems are so self-evident and baked into the inherent structure of it. Like, so for example, one thing we're gonna talk about is that a lot of the scenes are the same scenes from The Savior's Champion with like two or three different thoughts, but otherwise exactly the same dialogue string. So like, that's really irritating to read, but if it wasn't irritating for you to read on a visceral level, you're not going to care about that as a criticism. Exactly. And so, like, don't feel like we're personally, like, if you love this book, number one, maybe don't watch this video. Like, I really liked the Disney remake of Beauty and the Beast when it first came out, and I could not watch, and I love Lindsay Ellis. Like, Lindsay Ellis is a content creator. Rip. I love her channel and her videos. I could not watch her Beauty and the Beast, the new Beauty and the Beast video, because I knew that I had so much like love for it that even though a lot of her points were correct, I eventually watched it a couple years later. I couldn't and I didn't. I was like, nope, I'm not I'm not gonna do this. Eventually I watched it and I was like, yeah, I see it. I still love it anyway. Please guys, at no point whenever we talk about issues with books, are we trying to like take away the joy they might have brought to you. Reading is ignore Will's faces, guys. <laughs> Focus on me. Ignore Will's faces. Reading is a subjective experience. Everybody enjoys things differently. I did not enjoy this book and I'm going to be open about that. So if you uh, are coming into this expecting me to like it 
that's not what's coming. I'm going to temper the way I usually do this because I usually like to overstate just a little bit like how objective my opinion is because I think it's kind of funny. Yeah. So I'm going to temper that back a little bit from what I normally do because a couple of the comments on Priory of the Orange Tree, another book we did, had mentioned that like, oh, I like this book, but your guys' points are really good. And that makes me kind of feel like I should have been a little bit nicer to the book, especially because that was before the blizzard that was Savior's Champion and Ice Planet Barbarians and Savior's Sister and God, I'm tired and alone in the universe now. I'm so tired. <laughs> so I will say there are things in books and it's the savior sister that are objectively bad and bad writing that being said bad writing does not always stop someone from liking a book if that makes sense there are certain stories i like that have bad writing in them but i actually just don't really care so i will say i'll, I'll meet maria halfway with that which is that if you don't care about the bad writing i don't want you to care about the bad writing does that make sense cool. enjoy whatever you would like to enjoy and with enough preamble We'll say that Savior's Sister, because we haven't explained it, is the other half of The Savior's Champion, which is a self-published book by Jenna Moresi, who's a big-time YouTuber, um, who people love, and she thinks she's great, but actually... Cut that out, please! <laughs> no! <laughs> Jenna seems like a fine like content creator. A lot of you have said you don't like the book, but you like her content. We are not here to attack Jenna. Will, we are not here to go for Jenna. Okay, all right. Right, so this is the companion novel. That one took place from the viewpoint of Tobias, who is uh, a young man in a, yes, Maria, vaguely Greek fantasy setting, who enters a tournament to try and become the husband of the savior, which is the uh, magical queen of their country called Thessin. And he's all like, I'm too cool to like a princess, but I need money from a family. I apologize that my miming is not as good as Maria's Kabuki theater. The Savior's Champion took place from his point of view. And this one takes place from the viewpoint of Leila, who is the savior that we mentioned before, but she's in secret. And nobody, none of the readers of the Savior's Champion realized it until the exact last moment that the author revealed it. Revealed it. And so now we get the other half. And in that, in The Savior's Champion, we were promised that there were politics going on behind the scenes. She's dealing with Brontes, her father, who's like the regent and trying to kill her. And there are senators she's having to fight and assassinate. And she's having to maneuver in this political court intrigue. Now, Maria, my lovely co-host, let me yeah. ask you a question to start this review. Yes. Would you say that that is what is revealed to have happened in the Savior Sister? So, um, Jenna tried. Like, she attempted to deliver that. She wrote what I think was politics as best as she could. I don't think she's the best politics writer. Similar to, like, you know, Lindsay Ellis is not the best CIA and, like, underground uh, American military uh, government writer. I don't I don't think Moresi's strong suit is politics cuz I don't I don't think Moresi's strong suit is Moresi does not understand politics at all and unfortunately that shows up in the book. The politic plot line cannot really function very well because Moresi does not actually understand politics pretty clearly, which we'll get into, but it's kind of a problem if you're writing a political book and you don't actually understand even the basic levers of government or how it functions or like or how a court functions. There's a lot of Senate meetings in this. And a lot of the Senate meetings are like, this is the government. Number one, they have Senate <laughs> meetings all the time. Like almost every day for the 30 days, there is a Senate meeting. And there's one where they were like, we were discussing taxes and levies for the people and for the, the like agriculture and stuff like that. And that was like the only time where like actual like here stuff that running a kingdom actually requires comes into. Also, the senators are not elected. They're actually not even a Senate. They're really just like the small council from uh, Game of Thrones. So to give some background, yeah, let's let's start at the beginning and well, let's go through. So Layla is the savior. Oh, before we start, I'm sorry. Again, interrupting. I apologize for my <gasps> You misogynistic man whore! You interrupting a woman! I will flagellate myself later for contributing to the patriarchy. We listened to the audiobook, so you didn't pick this up, but she, as in referring to Layla, is capitalized in all of the book. It is super weird. Really? Yeah, it's she. And I don't really understand why. The thing is that people seem to think that when you capitalize God, like the Christian God, that's as a sign of respect. So you do that when you're doing a sign of respect to somebody, but that's not why it's because- But he's a proper noun. There's there's gods, which are lower case. And then there is God, which when you say God, capital G, it means the Christian God and, or the Judeo-Christian. So to capitalize she is, because that would mean one she, like proper noun she, like- 
it's really annoying. But continue now that you have that information lodged in your brain. Thank you. That makes my life so much better. So Layla is the savior. Her mother was cruelly murdered when she was still in the womb. She has been raised, I think, Delphi's mom is the woman who cut Layla out of her mother. So she's got her sisters, Delphi, who she's really good friends with, Cosima, who's even from a young age, they're not that close. They're, their relationship is kind of strained. And that's before she grew the titties. So. And that's before. The evil titties. Layla discovers that she's playing with her friends and she ends up stumbling and hearing her father talk to this guy Romulus. And he's like, we need to kill Layla. And while she's overhearing them, she realizes that Brontes had Romulus kill her mother and that he wants to kill her. And she's young, like young enough where they're like, let's play tag. Or let's play ruler and I want to be the queen. So in my head, I picked nine because even though that's not as young as you're originally read, led to believe, what happens next, I had to pick an age in my head that- it It's the only plausible age. Yeah, because she gets this information, gets really upset, but almost immediately decides to hold this young girl who is not her friend, but she knows she exists, named Pippa, hostage. Pippa is Romulus's granddaughter and Pippa as we discussed in the last book is in the book they call her delayed so and at this point she has never spoken in her life like she doesn't speak and Romulus comes into his chamber and finds Layla just brushing Pippa's hair and then she threatens to kill Pippa if he won't defect from her father and now come work for her nine-year-old self and help her thwart her father. So some of you may be thinking, oh, this is really psychologically interesting. That's dark, but like it's something she needs to do as a child. That could be really interesting. To explore the ramifications. No, this starts the beginning of the book, which is that in this book, Layla is a straight up psycho and it is never acknowledged the horrible violence she inflicts on other people and how that would blow back on her. And it's not even like she has like, okay, to function, I need to keep that part of myself away from my conscious mind. And locked. No, it's very clearly the author just not wanting to bridge. I do horrific violence and torture people with a knife and... Oh, I'm a giggly girl. Isn't it cute, Tobias? It is really weird, guys, because it, it, it there's this dissonance that happens where D Layla will get real dark and do dark things, but the minute she steps out of that situation, she goes back to being the normal Layla who's narrating stuff, and the two aren't, like, super meshed. I'm not saying that she needs to, like, be carrying the weight of everyone she's killed all the time, but, like, well mentioned, if she, like, stuffed it under and then there was a time where it like came up and like got her the only time she's vaguely worried about her killing people is when Tobias finds out she's killed people and she's afraid he'll judge her but she never grapples with her own feelings about killing people it's just presented as absolutely necessary and granted a lot of the people she kills have done some bad stuff and can be seen as necessary but there were a couple kills in this that were actually quite gruesome that i think were really avoidable it's actually almost more of an informed trait i feel like because okay so theoretically these senators are trying to kill her but we never actually see them do anything on screen that's particularly bad so yeah they need to be stopped but do they need to be murdered we'll get more into the fact that Marissi doesn't seem to realize you can't just rule as an autocrat a country. Like, you need people to control the levers of government. And, like, yeah. maybe some noble families won't cooperate with you if you murder their senators. Yeah. But after M Layla, in about three pages, says, oh, okay, my dad's going to kill me. I digest this information. My plan is to threaten to assassinate and murder a child. And this works, by the way. Ramios is like... All right, I'll get him not to kill you. We then have jump into the future right until her birthday. If you were thinking, oh man, that must have been such a complicated thing to raise Pippa beside her as one of her sisters, but also know, oh, I got to kind of keep myself somewhat separate and distant from her. In case I have to threaten her again. That would be a really fascinating kind of mix of how do you think about that? What's the intimacy there? No, her first interaction with Pippa is, hey, let's walk and talk as we go figure out what's going on with this champions tournament and the Senate meeting. And it never comes up again. She never thinks to herself like, I threatened to kill this woman I now love as a sister. Romulus continues to listen to her. And one of two things, either you maintain that you're willing to kill Pippa or Romulus stops. Like once you fall in love with Pippa and she's your sister and you love her, Romulus doesn't have to listen to you anymore. And that would work if she at all tried to treat Romulus, even with begrudging 
respect. Like she's treated Pippa well. He begins to see that she might be a slightly better option than Brontes. You know, maybe she grows to appreciate how he has like helped her for all these years, even though she's at the point where they both know she wouldn't kill Pippa. You know, that would be such a fascinating way for her to get someone on her side without the threat of violence and or just killing them because she is not here to recruit members to her cause the one person and we'll get there that she does recruit to her cause recruits himself that's it (laughs) hardcore and she keeps being like no i'm gonna murder you and he's like no i can be useful and she's like oh fine i can't murder you and that is exactly the tone in the narrative which again because layla is a straight-up psycho so They walk and talk, and the thing is that they go to the Senate, where it's Brontes and a bunch of his senators that he has brought into his power, and I don't remember their names, and I'm going to forget all their names besides Romulus. They have this Senate meeting, and the Senate meeting is basically to be like, we're doing the tournament. And she's like, no, I don't want to do the No, I lied. I think the first one, she's like, I would like my power now to be able to rule and stuff. And they were like, but... Layla, your highness, your supreme ruler, we agreed that this was the safest method to protect you and your realm was by having us rule instead of you for your safety. And she's like, that's obviously bullshit, guys. That doesn't even sound like a good explanation. Why would you even say that? I want it. And they're like, no. Then her father's like, we'll put it to a vote. That's obviously not going to go well since they're all on her side and she has done nothing prior to this point. Like she decides to egg on a vote for her like own ruling, knowing that it's gonna fail because she's recruited no one, none of the senators have she brought over to her side. There's been no diplomacy or like espionage on her end. And so they vote her down and she's like, ah, fooey. After this scene, one of the senators who like voted her down, she like kills. To be fair, and again, this is going to show the weird fixation this book has on sexual stuff. She shadow walks, which we'll talk about how stupid this is, into his room where he's And then she ties him up and is like, okay, I'm going to kill you unless you tell me what I need. And he tells her and then she kills him anyway. Next scene, her and Delphi have a talk about how she needs to get laid. And I'm not kidding. There may be another scene in between those two, but it's really close. Where Delphi is like, you never had a man and I know you're sad because you'll never be able to have one. Even though I have sex with all of the servant women because I'm awesome or whatever. I kind of hate Delphi in this book. Yeah, Delphi is a little, I liked her better in the first book. Again, the if, the less you saw of these characters, the more you were like, oh, okay, they could be kind of good. And then in this book, you're like, oh God, no, I do not want to see all the weird warts they have on them. And there's also a scene where, like, Cosima's introduced again, and she's introduced showing Layla this very attractive guard. And Layla immediately is like, oh my god, I am overcome with my loss. Like, she literally is, like, knees weak, heart going out of her chest for this beautiful blonde guy. I think his name's Asher. Cosima's like, isn't he scrummy, Layla? Oh, isn't he? And, and Layla's like, no, he's fine, I guess. I'm, You know, I'm not into him. Like, that's, it's cool. It's fine. And Cosima's like, all right, if that's what you say. And then I think after she kills the senator, she finds Layla having sex with Asher. And then she gets really mad. And like, now granted, Cosima, like the text implies that Cosima definitely knew that she did have something for Asher, despite her saying she didn't, and that Cosima's doing it to get at her. I have a much, a, a way more favorable opinion of Cosima. <laughs> In this book than from the first one. And also just from like when I started, I thought she was a real bitch when I started. But like, I I think a lot of that is just like... Part of it is my inner contrarianness is like the author clearly wants you to like this character and isn't giving her a fair shrift. So I'm going to like her and also titties. But um... (laughs) (laughs) for me, it's just a matter of I feel like she was a wasted opportunity and that like she was written into a corner. Delphi, Pippa, and Cosima, there could be a lot more interesting of a sisterly dynamic with them while also being a certain amount of tension and palace intrigue. But Marissi is not here for nuance. So uh, Cosima is presented immediately as, and number one, someone Layla should not trust and someone uh, Layla should not actually consider a friend, maybe sister in the, the sense that they've been raised together and she does have fondness for her because of that but immediately presented as not someone she should trust which made me go why did you pick this girl to be the savior that's the next plot point which is that the competition is going to go forward even though she feels that a competition to find a husband is like it's objectifying to her because she's just like it's something to be sold off which again makes no sense in her cultural context 
But we're not even going to explain. We explained that last time. It makes even less sense here. Moresi's completely narrow view of the tournament as bad is actually a real problem with this book, but we'll get into that more in a little bit when we talk about the competitors. But the tournament is going to go ahead against Layla's wishes. So she's like, you know what? What if I was really clever and had Cosima pretend? No, no, no. You're missing something, my dove. Your memory is such, so much better than mine. She finds out through her network, which is not a good network. So we're going to use terms Bronte's network. What is that? We'll discuss. <laughs> and Layla's network. And Layla's network is Delphi and a man locked in a dungeon. Talos. Talos. That's that's it. That's what we got. Anyway, so she finds out by killing that one senator, the one who overruled her and that she was jacking off. She finds out that this tournament is actually to murder her. And to put this in perspective, when I was reading Savior's Champion, I did not immediately think that the tournament was something that was bad for Layla. And I actually think, tension-wise, that's pretty cool. But no, immediately, like before the tournament starts, Layla knows that this tournament is to kill her. That her father is planting three assassins in it who are going to kill her. And then she does like a bunch of sleuthing. And by sleuthing, I mean she kills people. Finds out a person <laughs> who knows a piece of information. She kills them for the piece of information. And that's how she gets most of her information. We probably will not even talk about when they happen in the book because they're extremely perfunctory and they don't build on each other and there's no real tension in them. She shows up, maybe she fights a bit. She gets the information and then kills them. It's it's extremely by the numbers. I think there's only two times that she kills them before she actually gets the information. And then she's like, what does this slip of piece of paper mean? And I don't know. And then she has to deal with that. But it, it, she sleuths her way into figuring out that it's three assassins and that eventually they're going to kill her on her wedding night. And she's like, oh, dang, how am I going to defend myself? And one of her servants, so there's this point where Layla talks about how everyone besides her sisters treat her super holy. Like, she's not a human, she's an object. And she talks about how men do this. Like, she's never had any real relations with a man because everyone just views her as this holy object and kind of almost because of how her father has, has structured things, infantilizes her. And then she goes, and then she had her gaggle of faithful servants who treated her uh, slightly less than holy. And then immediately, they don't even treat her a little bit holy. Like, they're asking <laughs> her very personal questions. They're messing with her. They're, they're literally, it's like college roommates. Yeah, they're like scolding her while they're bathing her. They're like, oh, who do you like? Oh, this is hilarious. Layla, you have to have preferences. I hope they have a nice cock. And Layla's like, oh, why would you say that? And they're like, tee hee hee hee. So, no, that is not slightly <laughs> less than holy. That is, they treat you exactly like Delphi treats you. That is, there is no difference. They just also serve you. Like, th there you go. Well, that's actually an interesting uh, character idea of Layla being a little classist, but it won't be explored. Don't worry. That would be make the author feel a little conflicted about her characters and like. Okay. One of the servants, when they're like having a romp, uh, mentions like, man, I wish we could pretend to be the savior because we'd enjoy it more. Because Layla's like, I don't want this. I don't. I don't, this, this this tournament is done. Objectifying. And one of the servants is like, I wish I could be the same. And then she's like, oh, but that's an idea. What <laughs> if I had, nobody knows what I look like. My father definitely didn't tell the people he hired to kill me what I look like. Why, why would he? Um, so I will just have someone else pretend to be me. So then my assassins never know who I am. And then I can infiltrate and try and learn stuff from them. So she basically hashes this plot. And at first, Delphi has the reaction I had. Now, granted, like I said in the first book, I absolutely would have gotten myself down there to spy on these men in their natural fucking habitat. A girl's got to know what she's up against. But not if there was a plot to kill me and I was literally going into the den of the assassins. Like, that premise was that she was just coming down to see stuff and it's easier to tell if people are assholes if they don't think you're the savior and whatever. But anyway, she tells Delphi. Delphi's like, this is a terrible idea. I don't think you should do this. And she's she convinces Delphi. A lot of this book is Delphi having a kind of reasonable response to something and then Layla being like, no. We're doing it this way. And Delphi going, okay, we're doing it that way. <laughs> they hatch this plan and she's like, who could pretend to be me? Man, they've got to be really beautiful and they've got to be pale. So Delphi's out because she's dark skinned. Cosima's the only option uh, <laughs> to pretend to be the savior. And Delphi's like, but Cosima and you don't have the best relationship. And she regularly does stuff to make you feel like shit. Like, I don't, sister, I don't think this is a good idea. And she's like, no, 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 it's fine. 
what could go wrong? A lot. A lot could go wrong. <laughs> so they embark upon the tournament, and she doesn't actually watch when during their presentations when they're in the Coliseum, and they all have to come out and get their laurels. She uh, doesn't actually, like, go to that. She's off. I think this is the part where she goes to see Talos for the first time. So Talos is one of her mother's competitors. He was one of the last few guys, and during the Sovereign's Choice, which is who gets to leave, he, Talos was let go. There was a man that, like, her mom actually loved who did not win brontis i think killed him was the implication but talos genuinely liked her mother was good to her and i don't know why does it ever explain it i don't know why i'm just realizing i don't know why why is he locked up why is bronte keeping him i think brontes didn't like him for some reason yeah but there has to be a better reason than guys so so here i i call upon <laughs> all of you who read this Please, I might have just missed this. Was there a reason that I'm blanking? I just realized right now, I have no idea why this man is locked up. I don't actually remember either. And also, was he scarred and like all butchered up before he went? Or was that because of torture? He also has a beautiful face. And also to put this in perspective, Talos is the man who in the Savior's Champion, there was that one uh, challenge that one challenge where they all were strapped down with a, a heart monitor. And if it went too high, Talos had to literally stab them or like cut stuff and like fuck with them. That was Talos. He didn't want to do it. Talos is actually a really nice guy, but he looks really gruesome and he wears like a, a black mask thing over it. But his face is actually really gorgeous. So her and Talos have this like... I actually like their relationship. It's cute. I'm gonna, I hate it's to say cute. it, but it is cute because she, cute. like, he's large and intimidating and she's just like totally little bird with him. And she's just like, yeah. oh, tell me a story about my mom. And he calls her yeah. little light. And it's and cute it, and it, it belongs in a better cute. book. Talos as a character is fascinating and he, did, he needed more, like, more time should have been given to him. And he's like, he deserved it better. He also explains, like, if you had that bond better explored, it explains a lot of her weird behavior more. Like, yep. maybe the reason she is so violent is because he was her only real, like, surrogate father to raise her. Maybe, you know, that's where he got some of these ideas. Yeah, Talos is the one who taught her how to fight. So, like, Layla is pretty good at, between her shadow walking... But she doesn't really use as much as she should in fights. We'll get there. We'll talk about how overpowered it is. And also underpowered. Like, it turns on and off at will. But anyway, Talos is the one who taught her how to fight. So he's a a father figure. He's a nice guy. But he also learned stuff about the... So, oh, I forgot. Prior to this, she's like, I need to find out who the competitors are. So she gets the 17... She gets the competitors' papers, which is when the competitors were being interviewed to be competitors. They wrote down... This is the name, eye colors, length of unhard cock, all that stuff. Important details. Very important. Now, I think they put that because when they were like Musume, who's this woman who inexplicably has a Japanese name. Musume is her like the head of her staff. She has a bunch of ladies in waiting. She has a bunch of servants. And then there's Musume who like has her calendar and everything. Musume comes and is like, what do you want? We're, we want a couple of guys to be what your preference is. What is your preference? And Layla's like, I don't care. I don't plan on marrying any of them. This tournament is stupid. I don't like it. So they're like, no, no, no. You you have to give me something. And Musume is always described as very... Blank-faced. Blank-faced. That's a little odd, actually, now that I think about how she has a Japanese name. But go ahead. And so she says, I want a man with a huge cock. Like, she's being... Facetious. Facetious uh, is how you say that word. But- <laughs> <laughs> I probably have COVID, Okay. <laughs> And so, like, I'm sure Musume, being Musume, wrote big cock. So they measured guys. But again, they only measured the guys soft. So how do you, like, you could have been walking away from some prime cock, guys. Some people are growers, not showers. They are. We all deserve equal representation. And they did not get it. It's all this information, but she realizes when she gets the pieces of paper that there is only 17 pieces of paper. How Musume didn't realize, like, how did no one realize that there was not enough? Like, if I was Musume and somebody told me, I only want you to actually pick 17 guys, I would go, why? I'm supposed to pick 20. There's 20. And Musume is a buy the book. I got to do my stuff. Normal, normal. No, no, no. 
Only 17. Because the other three are the assassins from Brontus. Layla, like, snuck her way. She got these pieces of paper. She's looking through them. All of her sisters are like, ooh, he has a big cock. He sounds handsome. And then Masumi comes and she's like, you're not supposed to have this. This was information that you were not supposed to be pertinent to. Please give me the pieces of paper. But Layla's like, man, there's only 17. Why would this be? It's because the other three are the assassins. So I just have to match these pieces of paper. And then whoever the other three are, those will be the assassins. So all she actually had to do to figure out who the assassins were was actually watch their presentation. At this point, she's memorized their names. She knows who the 17 she she knows. So if she would have just watched the presentation, which everybody told her to do, and she could have watched from the shadows of the arena because she does that exact thing in this exact space during a later challenge because she didn't want to be on the stands because then people would see her bling bling shiny shiny skin and she didn't want to do that which is fine but why didn't you watch it because during the first actual challenge like after this she goes in and she now has to find who the evil guys are if she would have just watched the presentation she would have known exactly who they were because there would have been three random names she hadn't heard before and descriptions that didn't match any of the pieces of paper she had and she would have immediately been like ah it's those three. I got it. When I go in pretending to be a healer, I will know exactly which three are trying to kill me. But that's not what she does. She doesn't go to the thing. She goes and she talks with Talos instead. And then everybody's like, they're going to a Senate meeting and Wimbledon, who like, I don't like the way they describe him. Like Wimbledon is a plus size guy and they're very fat phobic. Like he's described really disgustingly. He's like very pallid and weak and like pudgy like is the impression you get of him but like i don't know what's so bad about him as a guy like he's just doing his thing he's literally just a man doing his job who is terrified of the person employing him so like nothing about him i don't know i I just didn't like the way he was described it was really weird if he was an asshole that's the thing about these characters is that everyone who isn't one of the good people is not described as a real person really the narrative does not like them and it will just be mean to them constantly and it honestly is a little existentially depressing after having read about 1200 pages of this where it just it's so depressing to be in the worldview of like all the main characters are great they're kind of vain and petty but everybody else is an absolutely horrible person that we just like we just spit on. And we all, you'll feel that by the end of this review, I think. He's just described really terribly. And there's this point where she, like, gets him in his room and he, like, his fat folds and his sweaty skin. And it's just, it's really gross. I didn't like it. But anyway, Wimbledon comes in and he was like, are you ready to hear the news of the tournament and this challenge? Abrantis is like, sure. And she's like, just give me the D. Or no, it's literally to Layla. And she's like, I don't care. And he, he's like, well, three men are dead. And Layla's like, three men are dead. Dad, this was one. What? How How did they die? How did they die? And Wimbledon is like, well, they died trying to win the saviors. And she's like, no, no, no. How were they killed? Was it the the labyrinth? And he was like, no, it was um some of the other competitors. And she's like, who the fuck were these competitors? I am ready to find out who these awful men are. So this is the point where she's like, now I'm going to don my garb. And she literally like throws on a cloak, grabs a bag, throws some perfumes in it and decides I'm going to pretend to be a healer. And her and Pippa go down and she's like, Pippa, go get food. And Pippa comes back and is like, I got bread and apples. <laughs> Great job, Pippa. You're, you're doing your best. And she, she gives... Pippa shadow walking and it's actually quite cute. I love Pippa. I don't like she's presented as a character who's like impossible to find romance. The book condescends a little bit to yeah. her but she's like she's a sweet character otherwise. She's a sweet character and I would have liked a little bit more for her but anyway so they go down and so this is the scene and we described this in the first review like Layla jumps down Tobias's throat and accuses him of killing people because she gets there and she starts healing people and she's like, oh, I heard men died. What happened? And she's just rubbing salve, but secretly blessing them. They're like, man, it was this uh, terrible dude. There's the, the dragon and he's terrible. And she looks and she's like, oh, that's one of the names I don't know. One of my killers, check. And then there's this other guy and he's really scared. And then they were like, but the worst was the shepherd. He is a really <laughs> normal looking guy. He's just really like, if you saw him, you wouldn't think. No one mentions that he is covered in tattoos. Like they're describing <laughs> people and they just keep describing the shepherd as just, you know, like you wouldn't think like he's just a normal 
looking dude. And so then she she finds broke, beaten Tobias crumpled in a corner. And she's like, you look normal and bloodied like you were punching someone. It has to be you. And then she yells at him. And then we get the whole, like, there's this thing that happened. And Will mentioned this a little bit before. But a lot of the dialogue or a lot of the interactions that happened in the first book I knew what was a lot of the thought process behind it. I knew that Layla had misunderstood that to buy it. Like she'd read cues wrong, misunderstood. I didn't know it was because people had badly described the shepherd, but frankly, that doesn't add anything. But a lot of their interactions where it's literally just a scene you already saw in Savior's Champion, her thought process doesn't lend as much as I thought it would. There's no value added. She is not a mysterious character. And the thing about it is that the way that Moresi writes dialogue is very like one person says something, the other person says something, the other person says something. Every once in a while, there's a little bit of a thought thrown in. And this is fine. Laconic dialogue, it works really great. The problem, though, is that that means that large sections of this book, and especially the interactions with Tobias, which are supposed to be important, tend to just be the exact same text as the Savior's Champion, but with a thought tag or two from Layla instead of Tobias. And like Maria said, It's stuff that was very clearly she was already thinking. We don't need to know about it. So a lot of the scenes that are repeated just play as point for point carbon copies. Now, if you were someone who really enjoyed them the first time, having that happen might be fine for you. Like that might be something that you enjoyed. It was so painful the second time. Some of the lines are so bad. Just some of the dialogue is so painful and you have to relive it. Ah, it's just, it's, it's not... I'm not here for it. And it just, it made the book like repetitive for me. Like I was just reading things I had already read verbatim and it's not like scenes were shortened or condensed. It would have been really great if there would have been some different dialogue exchanges, different words. And this is how the conversation happened for Layla. Or if we got a little bit more of the conversation that maybe Tobias as a narrator wouldn't have given us. I was thinking the same thing the whole way through. Yeah, that would have been great. It happens at one point a little bit later, there's like a page or two that I don't think was in Tobias's point of view that she thinks about differently. Some people are going to be like, okay, but this is just an inherent problem with writing a, a side. A companion, yeah. A companion book, yes. And the thing is, yes, but then you need to bake in ways of combating the the basic structural problems with writing a companion book. So a lot of you guys, I'm sure, have read a book called Ender's Game. It was like, it's very popular for middle school kids. There was that book. And then like about 20 years later, I think the author went back and was like, hey, let me tell the story of this other character who was at school at the same time and was a side character in Ender's Game. It's called Ender's Shadow. It is also an excellent book. Both are very good books. But both of them tell different stories. Different things are going on. So structurally, each book works on its own. Again, you could actually read the companion novel without reading the original, and it kind of works. The structural problems here do not work the same way because you start getting bored of any time Tobias is on screen, and you're like, okay... Let's hurry this up. The other problem is that all of the scenes of her going into the labyrinth to talk with Tobias do not function as scenes in terms of driving the main plot, which is what she's doing with the senators. For Tobias, yes, this was a life or death experience, so he really cared what happened to the labyrinth. In terms of the structure of this book, it does not matter what happens there. It's sort of like um, a love interest plot, but now it's swelled to being about 70% of the book instead of like the 20 to 30% it actually should be. This becomes a little bit less of a problem later on once they get out of the castle. But in the beginning, she goes there and then she goes and does senator stuff. But it's not like she has a revelation with Tobias that makes her do something different in this, different. this senator plot. Line. Exactly. And that is how you could have fixed this is have things that happened in the labyrinth impact what's going on outside of it. And so there's only two things that happen in the labyrinth that impact anything. So she's here to learn about her assassins. She learns mainly about them in this in- initial thing where she learns they're all assholes, they'll kill people at will. And then Talos later gives her some information about them, which is basically they're all assholes, they'll kill people at will. That is it. She gets the same information from Talos. And Talos is like, watch out for the shepherd. He's pretty bad. Which is exactly what everybody told her in the labyrinth. And so when Antaeus is killed, that impacts Layla because now her three assassins have gone down to two. The only other thing that connects to the overarching plot, and there should have been more of this, is that Enzo is a spy for the Kavarian queen. For those of you that don't remember, Enzo 
which sounds like an Italian name, but I don't. They're Italian don't Russians. That's always the impression I got is the Covarians are yeah. Italian Russians. Yeah, that's the vibe. The accents in this book were Russian. There's a this whole plot where Layla thinks Brontes has an ally in Kavar that is plotting to kill Layla. She finds out there's a spy or she she doesn't even, she stumbles into finding out like there's no proof that there actually is a spy. And it turns out that the spy she was looking for never existed. But she finds out that Enzo actually is working for the Kavarian queen. And he's like, yes, we we need to know what's what's happening here. And she's like, I can't trust you, but I kind of trust you because you've been a really good guy this whole time. That's it. Finding out about Enzo and learning not even much from Enzo. That is it. Once that happens, her purpose, like I said, her whole purpose to be in this labyrinth and to be doing this stuff was to find out about her killers. And Delphi's like, stop going into the labyrinth. We did what we needed to do. And Layla's like... But that Tobias is just too gosh darn cute. And and the thing is, that's fine. But we already read those scenes. It would have been really easy to just cut, like have small, like the starts of the scenes and then have her back at, like, and then have Delphi, Delphi being like, so you saw Tobias again and have her be like, it's fine. I'm, I'm focusing. It, I felt it wouldn't have taken away from the book to just kind of gloss over some of that. It's a problem because structurally speaking, for the story that I'm going to say structure a lot because I'm an English nerd, for the structure that Maressi wants of their love story, she needs to bond with Tobias in these scenes. But these scenes are the same ones that we saw from Tobias's point of view when he was bonding with her. So it's boring because again, it's just the same tip for tat. And you would have thought that maybe she would have left some ambiguous portions in The Savior's Champion where he's like, and then me and Layla talked for a while so that here she could fill in no, what yeah. happened there that would have worked beautifully basically i think this book should have been a novella that Layla is actually just narrating to tobias once because at the end of the book they run off from brontes and i think it would have been much better if it's like while they were on the run she starts telling him the story like one night or something and that way you can skip through like okay this happened this happened you can even have some funny dialogue with tobias being like oh i didn't i didn't think you were thinking about my cock all the time you know something like that which is a very messy joke. And that would have been great. I think that would have been a much better use of this story because there is... Dip in and out. Exactly. And again, having it as if she's telling... Because she, at the end of the story, she never fully has told Tobias the whole story. Like, literally, he's asking for it. And Delphi's like, it's too long and complicated, mate. You'll have to get it another time. And it would have been great to have them on the run and just have it told in first person as if she was telling Tobias and then have him just randomly interject. Those are always so much fun. Yeah, it is. Or like, it could even be one of those things where she's an unreliable narrator. And then I dazzled you with my smile. I don't remember it happening that way, Layla. Like, yeah, that's always great stuff. And that could have worked really well. And so just having the scenes with Tobias play exactly how they did. Um, how did you manage to get into the shot? He wants pets. He wants cuddles. Oh, you know that that one uh, TikTok meme? Mother, mother, I crave <laughs> Violence, that's him. Um, <laughs> Back to where we were about a quarter of the way through the plot. <laughs> So, um, and I'm going to speed through some of this, guys, because we already did a really thorough plot review as far as, like, the tournament stuff. I'll try fill in with, like, the stuff going on on the side. So Layla finds out, like, there's this plot with Kavar, and she finds out by, like, she she finds out that her father's got somebody going outside and coming back in pretty regularly. And also, there's money leaving her accounts, like, her, her coffers is just slowly depleting. Now, she doesn't have access to her coffers, so how does she know this? She just <laughs> knows, like, from the start of the book, she knows that her coffers are being depleted. But again, she's not allowed or given any access to this at all. So how does she know? Maressi does not understand court politics or court intrigue. And the thing about it is because she does not understand it, a lot of these ideas become very diffuse. It's sort of like if it was really important, the layout of a house in a story, you would actually expect the author to maybe create a map of it so that they had a clear idea and they could communicate to the audience clearly like the killers in that the master bedroom, but they're in this room and that's like 10 feet away or something like that. This book does not do that with the politics. It's not like, oh, the keeper of the treasury has a nephew that Layla helped get into a good marriage. So maybe they go back and she can figure it out that way. Or she has. And he tells her like, hey, my uncle is every month takes out a small sum of money and is like, there's no way she shouldn't know this information, but she does. But she's trying to figure it out. And then somebody else tells her that there's someone going back and forth. And so she finds the guy like who's going back and forth and he's got a satchel and he's carrying a message and he's coming 
coming back and she like attacks him in the gardens and ends up making a fire. And it's one of the bodies that like she can't hide. So he just burns alive. Is this where she kills one of the palace guards, by the way? Because at yeah. one point, oh man, one of the so palace she- guards runns up to help a guy, a senator she's killing and she murders him and feels nothing in the moment she could do it like pure adrenaline and she does it but then afterwards like oh my god this is the first time i've killed someone who was not part of my father like it's literally just he stumbled into a situation that where i did look like the bad guy there's no blowback from any of the violence done unless it's her worried that somebody else will think less of her for it and it's just odd because like it's pretty known that like excessive violence does blow back mentally on people people have difficulty dealing with the realities of violence. So either they become, they get trauma from it, or they're able to harden their mind in a way to lessen the impact of that violence. So you go like, you know, that ethnicity is a subspecies. It doesn't matter what happens to them, right? They have to form this wall. Like they create logic. Right, like a container for it. So like you could have her constantly having to remember after this, every time she starts feeling guilt, no, this is what I have to do for the realm. This is the right thing. She doesn't do this. She just doesn't even think it. She she literally never goes, this was a good guy and I murdered him. What is the crisis of faith from this? This was someone crossed between the crosshairs of me and my father and I had to kill him. Really, this is on him. All these murders I'm committing are on are him. On, don't think that I'm trying to say Layla shouldn't have done any of this. Absolutely, like, she's in a shit situation. Now, there are some that she should not have done that I will argue because, again, diplomacy bringing people to your side and building your network instead of just killing off each senator one by one so suddenly it's just your dad and three other dudes sitting in a really big room okay guys when you take over a kingdom and this actually happens for dictators all the time the people who hold the keys of power are very important the commander of the army the treasury public works civil servants these are important offices that if you cut the head off of the country cannot function as well You need these people. I'm going to go back to A Song of Ice and Fire. When Daenerys Targaryen destroys the slavers of uh, Slaver's Bay, she runs into the problem that how do you now run this place if you killed off all of the ruling elite? And so she's forced to compromise with these slavers, even though she doesn't really want to. And there are difficult moral choices to be made. That doesn't exist here. None of that exists. And that's one of the things that I really disliked about how she treats Romulus, is that Romulus, we never get an understanding of why did he murder the savior? What are his goals now? Was he really loyal to Brontes? Does he believe in the plan or did Brontes force him? Well, also, there's no upper crust of society. It's literally Brontes is a ruler who just brings in other people. It's never like, oh, this was a rich family noble and I can't kill him because I need the power of the Medici or something. The seat of the treasury has always been held by the like Lannister clan and I can't yeah. like, it would, it would cause turmoil in the realm if I suddenly like they would pull their funds if I suddenly took away like the, none of that none of that internal politics there's no landscape until the end where you find out about Cecily who we'll get to eventually there's no noble families now you have the nobles like Flynn but Flynn also like isn't a prince his family was just really wealthy and there's no connection like none of these no noble families ever come to the palace even though that's something that would regularly happen in royal courts and stuff like at some point someone would come in but anyway she kills the guard she kills this guy he doesn't give her the information she needs this is one of those fights where I was like use your shadow walking please because sometimes like People will be holding her and she can literally shadow walk out from their hold. And then other times people are literally like punching her in the face and she she's like, and I couldn't shadow walk. <laughs> Why? I don't understand. And Maresi tries to sell it as she's so emotionally distraught that she can't, but she'll think to herself, I need to shadow walk. And if you can think to yourself, I need to shadow walk. <laughs> and her power is, all she has to do is go, my father's bedroom, and she's there. Why doesn't it work? Like, it just, it doesn't make sense. So she does this, she burns the guy, they find his body, and Brontus is like, someone's murdering the senators. And she's like, oh, the senators? There's a murder in my palace? Cast surprise! We need to find this person. And the thing is, you very quickly realize, Brontus knows that she's killing the senators. And very quickly... I started thinking, why doesn't she just kill Brontes? And she pretends, and the book pretends, that this isn't an option because Brontes has a network. But the network functions to put him as the throne. He has a claim to power because he's the sovereign. She has it because she's the savior, but because of the way like her mom died, everybody thinks they're protecting her. He has built a community of people who 
work for him. But if he dies, one of these random people can't suddenly become the sovereign. They would have to force her into a marriage with somebody that they controlled and have him be the sovereign, but they can't actually do that because the tournament doesn't work that way. And to put this in perspective, Brontes's network is the senators and then the person who he is sending messages to. It, hysterical because you eventually discover who everyone is and like she now has almost all the moving pieces by the end of it. And at the end she's like, I still have to discover Brontes's network and I was like hold it I thought we did like and, and number one again none of these plans work none of Brontes's plans work if he is dead there is a, a someone a spy in the palace who is working with Brontes and his entire plan with her hinges on her being able to marry him because he's getting benefits from her father if Brontes is dead that is now a no-go and this person no longer has any in to power in the throne. You're right. And the problem is, and this is what Mercy again, doesn't understand politics, which is that you get the impression that Brontes for 20 years, as Lady has been growing up, has been centralizing power around himself, right? All the senators are his lackeys. That's why we don't hear about any of the other interests of Thesson. But the problem with that is, if he has centralized power around himself, then she just needs to kill him and become the figurehead in his place, which she has a claim to. This is not a situation where like, you kill one tyrant, but the system is so entrenched that another one just comes up. It's not a systematic problem. He is a tyrant, so if you cut the head off the tyrant, you can just take over the body. She tried so hard to constrain Layla into this space that it actually doesn't make sense. And also, this is worth pointing out, Brontes is such a ridiculous villain. He is so mustache-twirling evil. There is not a single redeeming factor of this man. He is brutish and cruel and petty at every single point in this book. Brontes' plan hinges on killing his daughter, the savior, the person who will save the king, who keeps the kingdom alive. So what we learn is that it never rains in Thessin. And part of what she does is she keeps it green. So there's two things. Number one, it doesn't rain in Thessin. If she didn't like help, like it would be dry. But number two, there is a dark black plague that not only like kills the crops, but also will kill the people, like will make them sick. And she keeps it at bay. So he pretends he doesn't believe in her magic, but you find out by the end, because he's been taking precautions to make sure he survives, that if Layla dies, this is all gonna go. The land is no longer going to be fertile. We're back to a desert. Plague will wipe out half the civilization. So his motivation makes no sense to me, because what are you ruling? Rulers only work if they have people to till the soil and collect taxes from. It does not work if your people are dead. You also find out at the end of the book that he is on a, It's he doesn't just want power over Thessin, he wants conquest. He would like to take over the world, starting with their closest allies. The person he's working with, dad, has been training a mercenary army for this uh, plan. But the problem is, like, if you look at empires like Rome, a lot of times their land was fertile enough to be able to support an army. Because, like, until you take over the other place, you're not going to get, you can't depend on them for rations and, and supporting the army and creating the stuff. Because, like, people got to create armor. People have to, like, create the goods, like, textiles, all of that. Like, wars are expensive and require labor. So if all of Thessin is now plague-ridden and no longer has grain. What's his gonna be his base for his empire? Like, congratulations, you are king of the dead people and the sandy dirt. Here's the other thing about this that makes no sense, going back to the Rome example. Rome had a culture of militarism. It was a highly militaristic culture. It was conquest. Caesar, for example, went and basically genocided a bunch of Celts just because it would raise his status back home. It survived off of conquest in terms of its economy to a large extent. Like, so for example, what you were saying in terms of about it being a very fertile place, when they fought Hannibal, they lost at one point 70,000 men in one battle and they just kept chugging. They seriously lost a huge amount of their fighting men. And as a culture, they were like, we're not going to give up. We're going to keep going. It's Rome is really an insane culture, but it was one gear on conquest. Thessin is not. Thessin has not been to war for a long time, Layla points out. You don't get to high office in Thessin by going to war. It's literally like if the minister of Austria today was like, I'm hiring a bunch of US military contractors and invading Poland. Like, you're like, what? This is not a culture that does this. What's the motivation? Like, just wanting to go to war does not make sense if that's not what your culture gears you for and you don't have a concrete reason otherwise. And military coffers, and you find at the end of this, her coffer is empty. She ain't got no more money. They've used it to fund this army, but 
armies take a lot of money. Unless you have, again, people paying taxes to bring more money into your coffers, how are they going to fund a war that lasts more than a year? Standing armies are enormously expensive. This is why before the pre-industrial age, you basically outside of like China did not have them because they're super expensive to maintain. I mean, even if you look at medieval warfare, a lot of times like they have a campaign season because there's also a growing season and all these people need to get back to plant the field so that they can actually feed the rest of the realm. It's like it's Marissi has no idea how politics or logistics work. Where, where are you getting this money for this army? Also, where are these mercenaries coming from? I didn't get, I, it wasn't clear to me if they were in Thessin or if they were somewhere else or like. So there's this character named Cecily. I'm going to just unmask this now, guys. I was going to say, this is not quite working as well as our last one did in terms of running through the plot because so much of it is a train wreck. A lot of the plot is just not memorable. And like, the thing was this tournament was there was beats and a lot of the important beats to this are just eh. but anyway you find out there is a traitor a spy in the, the savior's court and she's like who is it who is it, it can't be Kasima. it has to be you know like blah 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 and the book wants you to think it's musume because she's always annoyed at layla and she's again very stoic faced and just mm. Layla, but it it's not it's cecily her her dress her, her seamstress basically they call her a dress fitter but that job was a seamstress ladies and gentlemen they were one person and cecily is presented as like almost a older sister or mother figure earlier and uh, and then you never hear about her except for like two scenes so I, I just didn't like her as a twist villain but she is the person working with Brontis and you find out that they knew each other from when they were young they wanted to get married she's been in love with him for ages and her dad trains armies and her and Brontis are both part of noble families and this is the first time you hear about actual noble families that impact the plot in a way that makes like any political anything existing outside of the castle basically because before this everything political is in the castle we had no idea about the tides of power outside of it and you find out that they were both from noble houses they, they grew up knowing each other he entered the tournament and they decided they were still going to be together so she's basically been working with him for years and years before Layla was born, her father is the one that Brontis is paying for this mercenary army. And her father, they're the ones that concoct the scheme to make it look like Kavar is trying to kill Layla. Turns out Kavar's queen is actually really chill and she doesn't like Brontes and she was not here to kill Layla. But the plan was when they killed Layla next to her body was going to be a note written in Kavarian saying like, down death to the savior, we hate the savior. And then Brontes was going to be like, oh, Kavar killed my daughter. I must go to war. And that was going to be the like machine that started. I don't like this conflict because again, there is nothing to rule if Layla is dead. And you find out that Brontes does believe Layla's powers work because there is this thing, the elixir of Pagar, which was never brought up. This is something that should have been planted earlier in the story mentioned. Cause like Layla's like, I need to fake healing potions. And at no point is she like, maybe I'll get some elixir of Pagar, which is my blood that has been turned into a, uh, a less potent medicine. And she actually mentions at the end of the book, like, oh yeah, they take my blood all the time to make this stuff. Never mentioned before that, though. And basically, Brontes has been storing in a pair of pants in his closet a bunch of these elixirs of Pagar, because if the plague happens, there needs to be enough for him and his queen to survive. But again, what do you rule? Who fights your wars? Who pays your taxes if they're all dead? And I don't know if you know this, but discontent leads to rebellion. You could say the savior is killed, they blame Kavar, and everybody goes to war, but then they see that all the money in the kingdom is being used for the war and none of it, like they're starving in their fields, Brontus isn't helping them. They would eventually, and pretty quickly I would assume, turn on him. And now he's also fighting a civil war in his own home. Again, against the people he's trying to get taxes from. Well, and the thing is, they can't get another savior. There's one savior, so once she's dead, Thessin will eventually shrivel and die. And again, Brontes believes that this will happen. He knows that Thessin needs the savior to succeed. So what is his end game here besides I am evil and want to kill people? He's not even Thanos levels of motivation. We mentioned this in our last video and I really want to hammer home guys. I think a much better use of Brontes and Layla's relationship would have been 
a Mother Gothel, Rapunzel-style relationship. Because, again, Brontes knows that Layla keeps the earth fertile, the plague at bay, the darkness in the ground, and she's overall a positive force. Would have been really easy to kill mom, for the plan to be to kill mom, and to raise Layla in such a controlled way, but to make her, like, to give her love and affection and make her a daddy's girl, but also to limit her education. Like, you're just getting art and like, I'm going to pump you full of romance books. Propaganda. And propaganda, like tons of propaganda, you know. Like you could even put in some like low-key abusive controlling behavior. Exactly. I think that would be fascinating. And when young Layla's like, Daddy, I want to go outside and see the world. You could have easily pulled like a Mother Gothel where you orchestrate like somebody acting like they're going to kill Layla. And then having Layla get so scared that she eventually becomes a, uh, those people that never want to leave their house. Agoraphobic. How great would that be if your daughter just never wanted to leave? And she wanted, like, Daddy was safe. Daddy Daddy was like kind. I mean, number one, I think that would be a fascinating relationship for Tobias to come into. Yeah. And for Layla to slowly, as she's gotten older, to see the holes in her dad's story and the way that things don't match up and to get to the point where she's strong enough as a person to be able to start recognizing the abuse for what it is, but also like at that point, it's really hard to hate your parents. There's so much love there. It's similar to Rapunzel and Mother Gothel. And also, you are just so sheltered, you don't understand things. One of the things the book doesn't play with enough is that she has only grown up in the castle, so she should be very sheltered in how she sees the world. There's this one funny part where she's helping Tobias learn how to fight. And, you know, her and Flynn have this... Uh, Tobias mentions the village he lives in, and her and Flynn, who's another rich kid, is like... What's a village? They were like, your governess never taught you how to yeah. fight? And he was like, governess, I live in a one-bedroom hut. And they're like, what's the hut? And he was like, you see this room? It's four times the size of my house. And then she's like, do you know what he's talking about? And he's like, I don't, I don't get it. Like, that was a funny moment. More should have been played on that. The clash of cultures between Tobias and Layla could have been really funny and good. But again, Maresi is not interested in really having her characters be people in their own right. So like it just I think that would have been a much more number one realistic approach for Brontes to take because then you get the realm and you get to be the ruler like a better way to orchestrate the tournament is to get someone that your daughter actually falls in love with that is under your control so you can she can feel happy it could have been something where like Flynn is the storybook hero she's always wanted but slowly she becomes disenamored of him over time they're also her because they don't actually have anything in common her sisters could have been planted by Brontes but it's also something where they have forged a real sisterly connection with her and they're sort of torn back and forth there's so many ways that's a fascinating and interesting story but the, the book is not interested in it and in general the book is poorer for its simplistic worldview we'll talk about this with Kasima at some point because Kasima could just have been such a more interesting character in terms of why she feels resentful to Layla. Maresi is just interested in her characters being super great and everyone else being super terrible. So I'm going to try in like two minutes get through the plot because <laughs> I think a lot of our points and our thoughts about this book are not directly related to like point A. To the events B. in it. And really like if you watched our Savior's Champion video, you got the main points. The stuff that happened into the background that I will fill in. She discovers there's a potential Kavarian spy. Cecily's the one who's like, oh, this is a war speech. And you find out that Cecily actually did that to to throw off their, uh, <laughs> it worked. You, you thought Kavar was evil. Kasima is slowly, like, becoming more and more distanced from Layla, and you begin to get the vibe that she's now, like, working with Brontes, and she's actively doing things that upsets Layla, like, oh, so here's a big one. Eventually, Brontes discovers that this has been a charade and that Layla has been hiding her identity from the competitors and he's really pissed. And then the next day, everyone is suddenly on board. Like, Brontes is like, yes, we'll hide your identity. This is the new plan. And everyone, suddenly all the servants are just calling her Layla and not your highness. They're actively making Cosima look super gorgeous and making Layla look not gorgeous. And immediately I went, oh, Brontes is going to use this to his advantage. He's now going to pass Cosima off as the savior. And that way, like, he can keep the savior alive for a while and not actually have to deal with Layla being a thorn in his side. And he can just kill her off now. And nobody would know. Nobody would know that he killed the sailor out the savior outside of, you know, her servants and the people in the castle. And that's apparently an easy thing to keep people from talking about. Also, 
really quick. You might have remembered in the last book where I went, how on earth did she convince the ha- entire castle not to say anything? Why didn't anyone s- slip up? She didn't. Everybody initially thought that all the competitors knew that Layla was the savior. And when Layla was suddenly like, uh, close the dra- drapes. I want all the curtains closed all the time. <laughs> or when they were like, uh, I'd like all of my sisters to look as fancy as I do. And I'd like us all to sit in four thrones. Nobody was like, Wow, Layla, that's kind of weird. Like It's a little sketch. But it also makes the fact that nobody found out that it never came out before Bronte's founding out, finding out even more insane. Also, uh, this happened, this is a consistent thing that comes up. At, like, So at the um, feast and then during some of the challenges, there's a dynamic whereby Cosima will do a thing to keep it hidden that Layla is the savior. So she'll be like, no, you ordered Romulus to do something, but you have no power here, so I have to do the opposite, for example, at one point. So Cosima will keep the secret, but then Layla will get really pissed at her for keeping the secret well, and be like, you seem to be a little too into this. And Cosima's like, yeah, but like, what do you want me to do? This is the only way to keep the secret from everybody, from all the competitors. A perfect example is during the the great Antaeus versus Tobias fight to the death, when beforehand, Cosima's like, wait, I'm gonna have to go out in front of everyone and pretend to be you, not just the competitors. And Layla's like, yeah, it'll be fine. Don't say anything, don't speak. And then Cosima's like, but what about Wimbledon? Wimbledon knows I'm not the fucking savior. And Layla goes, and I quote, don't worry, I'll handle it. So I thought she was gonna get to Wimbledon, somehow convince him like, hey, this is what's happening. I need you to keep your fucking mouth shut. Instead, She didn't talk to Wimbledon beforehand. So Wimbledon's doing the announcements. Cosima comes out and Wimbledon's like, you're not the savior. And then to keep him from saying something dumb like that, Cosima's like, hello, my subjects. Hello, Wimbledon. Lovely to see you. I'm obviously the savior. Everybody have a nice (laughs) time. But like, she made, when she saw his face, she was like, okay. Layla did not take care of this because how Layla was going to take care of this is hope that Wimbledon wasn't going to say anything during the actual live event and then kill him afterwards. <laughs> Guys, that's so dumb. You're banking on Wimbledon immediately not going, Cosima, what the fuck are you doing here? Where's the savior? You got so lucky, and thank God Cosima was quick thinking enough because she's like, oh my God, she talked in front of everyone? How? Dashy. And that was one of the scenes where I was like, nah, I'm kind of with Kasima on this. Like, what what did you want her to do? And this is a really good time, I guess, to talk about the fact that Kasima is a waste. I like complex relationships. I have a sister, and me and my sister have not always throughout the years gotten on. I have two sisters and double the level of dysfunction. There are times where you don't necessarily like each other, or like you're mad at each other, and you say dumb stuff, but you love each other. And then there are also times where you're jealous of each other. And I thought it would have been really great if Cosima hadn't just been evil titty savior and like, ooh, she fucks Brontis in the end. Oh, she decided she wanted to be queen. I thought it would have been way better if Cosima had been presented as someone who did love Layla, maybe not in a way that Layla loved, because, you know, people can sometimes, the way they love you can really grind against your nerves but if there had been some affection between this two but where Cosima did have resentment for Layla and living because like Layla has resentment for Cosima because Cosima gets the guys guys are into Cosima they want to sleep with Cosima no one wants to sleep with Layla oh uh, she's the savior <laughs> and on the <laughs> other side of it it would have been interesting to have Cosima have a moment where she was like they fucked me because I didn't matter but they talked about you they were in there na- like to grow up in the shadow of a living god is fascinating and also the idea that like Cosima would look at herself and be like i have all the things that layla doesn't i am beautiful in the ways she isn't what is wrong with me on the inside that i am not as valuable as her like that could have eaten at her over time there also could have been is she the daughter of a noble family maybe there are expectations placed on her from a very young age to be Layla's friend, and so she feels almost resentful as she does grow closer to Layla, that like, this is what I have to do, but I do love her. And like you said, sibling relationships are such a love and hate 
thing. Mm-hmm. They're complicated. And in this case, they would be complicated by the palace politics. And the thing is that Mercy does not treat her this way at all. She's actually extremely slut shamey of Kasima in a way that's yes. sort of weird. I did not like it. Uh, it's weird. It's really odd, especially compared to like how like awesome she thinks Delphi is sleeping with everybody. There's one point late in the book where once Brontes has discovered that Layla is hiding who she is, Layla um, sees Brontes and Cosima interacting. And this is where she figures out that Cosima is on Brontes' side. And Cosima says to Brontes, like, look, I wasn't able to seduce Tobias because for some reason that's the plan. And he's like, okay, you're worthless to me now. And she's like, Oh, no, I'm not. I can still do stuff. And then they have sex. The way it's framed is, is like, oh, look how like slutty and dull she is. But the thing is, Kazima in that moment is fighting for her life. She is trading on the one card she has to make herself useful to who someone we know has been trying to kill the main character, albeit unsuccessfully, for 20 years. And who has no compunctions about killing people, even in a sense. Like, we know Brontes doesn't care. So, like, I think I thought it would have been much more interesting if there is a loving relationship that you see from the beginning, because like I said, pretty much from day dot in the book, Kasima looks like a bitch. From when they're kids. From like there's an interaction kids. when they're kids where you're like, okay, that's what's up. She's sketch. I would have preferred them to have an actual relationship and then to actually grow distance, especially there's this point that happens and the poem part where Tobias has to give a poem <laughs> and he gets chosen as the winner and he gets to hang out with Kasima. On Kasima's end, she actually cries because it was the first time a man had said anything about her as a person. Now, granted, she should have put two and two together that this man doesn't actually know her. But again, I think Kasima is often viewed just for her body, whereas she looks at Layla as someone who people value. And see, Layla thinks people just value her as a savior. So it's two women completely reading the wrong thing about each other, which is great. It's not explored. <laughs> like the mutual misunderstanding that's happening. And Kasima cries. She's like, that was so beautiful. I've never had someone see me like that. And Layla doesn't immediately tell her, hey, uh, actually, I'm seeing Tobias. That that was kind of for me. She lets Kasima hang out with her with Tobias without telling her and only tells her afterwards like after this really embarrassing interaction with Tobias hey actually I'm seeing Tobias like he's 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 my guy I'm kind of into him Kasima you can tell is upset by this and that would have been a really great like as this story progressed as Kasima like if Kasima had come into the crown really enjoyed the attention, but initially been trying to help Layla, like actively trying to help her. And then slowly, as Layla maybe goes more to Delphi and consistently like doesn't go to her, and not that this is something that happened, but I'm saying I wish this is how this would have played out. She started like pulling back and after that where like she realized like like you knew it wasn't for you let me hang out with this man and like just to have her like break a little bit and not to say that she doesn't become an evil character she could but I think the journey from like actually being people who love each other I think that's fascinating and the thing about it is that it would take this book to do something it does not do at any point and that is have a character arc every character in this book is static from beginning to end. They do not change who they are. They do not change their views. Layla is the same character at the beginning as she is at the end. This book largely starts with all the characters already in the end point. You can't have Kusima and Layla's relationship evolving in that way because it doesn't evolve. It's just immediately at the end. And I think that's, it's a simplistic view. The characters can't change. I feel like Kusima was such a missed opportunity. I would have liked there to be a conversation between them. And I mentioned this to Will. Will and I texted a lot while we were reading this. As we do a lot <laughs> okay, guys. I knew when in the morning Maria was listening to this on her way to work because I would just get all caps texts about what was happening in the book. It was hilarious. And great. Anytime. Like, and, and I was able to put my notes together for this by literally just going, <laughs> scrolling back in the conversations that Will and I have had since I've been reading this. A thing that Layla does a lot in the beginning, and it kind of annoyed me, is she doesn't say if she actually likes someone. Like, she's into Asher, and Kasim is like, do you like him? And she's like, no, I don't like him. <laughs> like a boy, I don't like... <laughs> I'm, I'm too cool for that. And then Kasim is like, with him and I would have loved a scene when all of like when they confront each other because that doesn't happen in this book like you never hear from Kasima after she gets fucked by Brontes and Layla even notes that Kasima's forced moans and this isn't like it's not like they they romance there's foreplay before they have sex no he literally just throws her face into pillows and goes to town. I would have loved a scene where they confronted each other and like Layla like threw something like sleeping with Asher or like you were always throwing the men that would pick you over me in my face. And I would have loved Kasima to go, 
Layla, you said you didn't like them. Speak up. Tell me. Tell, I'm not a mind reader. Speak up for yourself. Stop stewing in silence and just expecting everyone around you to be a mind reader. We've all met those people in life where like they don't push back as much as they need to to assert their needs. And so you're in this uncomfortable relationship where you don't know how much to push because you can't figure out where their boundaries are. The book treats Kasima not being able to read Layla's mind as her being mean to Layla when you're right. Layla, she, she should there should be a moment where she's just like, Layla, you need to speak your mind mind. You're the savior. There is a power imbalance at play here where you can just say whatever you want and it's law and you're a living God. If you don't want me to sleep with Asher, say you like him instead of actively saying you don't. Or if you want to make Kasima an obviously bad heroine, have Layla say, you know, he is kind of cute and then sleep with him. And again, I don't think that's the way to go. I think having it where there there is these bitterness, there's this feeling, but there's genuine love, but then the bitterness drives them apart and sends her, Kasima, into the arms of Bront. It's kind of like if you've ever seen Shira and the Princesses of Power, there is uh, Catra and Adora. The, the main character. And Adora goes off and Catra has had a lot of bitterness growing up in Adora's perfect shadow. And so when Adora seeming seems to abandon Catra, Catra immediately, Adora is enemy number one. But they had a genuine affectionate relationship and it makes it a much more complex and sad interaction throughout the rest of the show. And I think that would have been a much better like analog to take for Kasima and Layla. But you're right, all the characters start evil, that end evil and- They're static. They're not really changing. And again, I think the problem is what we're talking about would take Moresi to acknowledge that Layla has communication issues. Yes. That some of the problems are on her. And Moresi is simply unwilling Again, it's an existentially depressing worldview where the good characters are good and the bad characters are bad and that's it. It's simplistic and it hurts the book. And to put this in perspective, guys, there is a character who ends up being a good character but who is presented originally as one of Brontes' people but he's not described badly. Visually, he's not described badly. Layla never thinks anything bad of him and his name is Hylas. He is Brontes' new secretary and he is just described as someone who obviously is kind of terrified of Brontes and is trying to do his best to be a good secretary. But every other character around Brontes is described badly because they're a bad character. There's not even characters that Layla thinks are good or maybe could be on her side but then turn out to be bad or characters she thinks are bad but then ends up being good. So like she never actually thinks anything about Hylas. When she finds Hylas about to commit suicide, off, also trigger warning, sorry guys, about to jump off a ledge because Brontes wants him to kill Layla and he cannot help in a plan to kill Layla because he genuinely believes in the savior and he's a loyalist. Layla very quickly is like, okay, you can be part of my team. Again, because she had no opinion about Hylas really versus everyone else. So like another really great example of an evil character presented as evil that like nothing ever comes up. There's this guy, his name's Castor and he's younger. He's a military dude. Layla tails him for a day and Castor misinterprets her tailing him for the day as her being into him. <laughs> and we're presented with an opportunity for Layla to take a man who is obviously into her and willing, despite the fact that her father father hates her and wants to kill her to sleep with her and is like you don't like those guys you're looking for a real champion what a good opportunity if you were someone trying to build your own network and get allies to pretend and trick this man into thinking that yes you would marry him to get some basic information out of him like it would have been so easy to be like yes how did you know but you know my father is against me, and how will I ever come to power, and how will my eventual, no, eventual husband get power with my father monopolizing everything? I just need someone to help, someone who, if anyone could help me overthrow my father, I would marry that person and make that, you know, like, and, and granted, I think that, like, doing something morally, like, ambiguous like that, because Layla does tons of stuff that is morally ambiguous, and, and not even morally ambiguous, like, bad. Morally pretty bad, yeah. Morally pretty bad. So to trick a guy for into getting information out of him, like she could have eventually killed him but to get some info and have him be like now i shall be the brontes like 
yeah, that would have been a really cool way to utilize Castor. But nope, she immediately is like, no, you idiot. I don't want to be with you. And he's like, well, if you don't want to be with me, that means you were spying on me. And now I have to kill you. So much of this book is a wasted opportunity because of how simplistic its worldview is. I think at this point, we've pretty much covered most of the plot. The book ends the same way that the Savior's Champion did with them going off to Tobias's family and then running off into the woods. There's one, there's a couple of things I wanted to mention because they were kind of dumb. Eventually, like I said, she finds out that like Kavar is not against them. Cecily, like she kills Cecily real brutally. And this was a woman who literally was a friend and a mother figure. No, no, no. You got to rewind. But she doesn't just kill Cecily. Her and Delphi catch Cecily. Cecily is like, I'm not going to tell you anything. And Layla cuts off her toes. She saws them off. This woman she has known since she was a child all of her life, she saws off her toes with Delphi next to her. I'm going to repeat what I said back in our review of Iron Widow. It is problematic to torture someone, full stop. It is also problematic to portray it as effective. Just think this through. Why does Cecily tell her the truth here? There is no reason for Cecily to tell her anything other than, I need this to stop in this moment. I'm going to lie very well. That is the problem with torture. It is not an effective means of intelligence gathering. And that is why portraying it as an effective means of intelligence gathering is a problem. And like this is the, this is the epitome. This is the top point of Layla's capacity for cruelty and violence going completely unacknowledged completely this is also a moment where so there's this thing where like we're not supposed to complain about man hatiness and i get it this is not the cause of the century that needs to be fixed but this book is weirdly man hating it is it, like it's throughout we actually haven't even talked about <laughs> the competitors and how much worse they are in this book but there's a part where cecily's whole thing is that like she is slavishly devoted to brontes and delphi is like oh, god i hate a woman who chooses a cock over other women or something like that and it feels like this weird okay to Layla to commit torture. It's very odd the way it is. There's also a certain amount of which Kasima's slut shamedness, I feel like, is a weird type of misogyny in a way, in that the author doesn't want to think about why you would sleep with a lot of men outside of just wanting to, which again, she doesn't seem to realize is also just an option. She, yeah, she's got lots of hot dudes, whatever. The book kind of vaguely frames it as. Isn't she needy? Isn't it kind of sad how she wants to have, she needs to have sex with all these men? Or she's throwing it in Layla's face because Layla can't. It's always portrayed badly. Versus Delphi, who also sleeps around a ton, but with women. And it's always portrayed as playful and fun. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess rewinding a bit because we are talking about it. The competitors in this book are actively predatory towards Layla a lot. Like, more even than in the first book. The Shepherd gives gives her a really long, well, not really long, just a very dis detailed description of how he's going to sex her. The other competitors try to grope her. One guy has his ear cut off, and then he starts trying to assault her as she's sewing his ear back in. And what's fascinating about this scene is that it actually kind of could have made sense if it was one of these things where the other men right then are making fun of him for his weakness and how he has had his ear cut off. And so you could have had a moment of looking at really, okay, in this moment, he needs to regain his manhood. And the only way he knows how to regain his power is to subject her to this is predatory advances. That's kind of actually makes sense. But that's not how the book frames it. The frame, the book frames it literally just like all the men think it's funny and it's expected. And it feels so cheap because it feels like just a way to make Tobias look better in comparison. Yes. The thing about it is that part of the reason the men are terrible is because Jenna Moresi doesn't feel that there is a valid reason to be in this tournament to begin with. She just fundamentally doesn't. And it's bizarre because there are so many. Like, let's say I'm part of an underclass of Thessin and I go, look, I could join this tournament and become king and immediately do good things for my people. Like, think about it like that. If you had a chance to win the lottery and become president, that's what becoming the, the sovereign is. Like, there's lots of reasons, very valid reasons why you would want to do this. You could do it for religious reasons. You could just do it because this is what is expected. But Marissa feels like, okay, she started with the paradigm of this is a sexist and objectifying tournament. And then Layla is like, it's sexist and objectifying and also it murders good people. Like, it's needlessly violent. Layla has this view, but at no point does she try to get the men in the tournament 
out. Her plan is never like, okay, let's save the people in this tournament. At one point, Raphael, one of the competitors, finds out her identity. And he kind of like blackmails her into being like, hey, you can let one of us out. I want to be that person. And she's really butthurt about it. And like, I understand as a character, it derails her plans. But there's never a point when it's like, yeah, of course he wants out. Everyone, you you yourself have said that this is a violent tournament that should not exist. And innocent people are dying. You know, like all the people that die, she frames as like, oh, like the victims of the tournament. That's why they're horrible. So they can die without us really caring. With Raphael, like he wants to get out of the tournament, but... He- even there's a point at which it is now like everybody now knows that this ruse was going on and the only people who don't know are like Flynn and Tobias and like she's still like Raphael still keeps her secret and doesn't tell Tobias even though everybody else knows and she still kind of treats him like a dick and there's even a point where Raphael is like yes I need to get out I don't want to be here but I'm not gonna like be a dick and she's like you're a man. You're all dicks. Um, <laughs> and and there's even a point where she's trying to read, like she's trying to figure out the deal with Kavar. And she was like, these must be for the Kavarian queen. And he's like, well, actually, Kavar doesn't trade in jewels. They have tons. They, they much prefer metals and stuff like that as trade gifts. And she's like, huh, this man is obviously educated and knows a lot more about inter-country politics than I do. I should, and he even offers, he's like, you know, I could stay and help you. And she's like- I think he actually can write Kovarian too. I don't remember, but she she literally is like, no, get out of here. You're blackmailing me. And again, you don't want to be blackmailed. You don't want, but like his life is literally on the line as well. And there's no sympathy for that. And again, the competitors are all like presented kind of as dicks and, and the men are just like overall, just like terrible. Like, I don't know. I felt that was very messy and like a little one note for me. Cause like Raphael eventually is presented as like a decent character. You can read between the lines. And again, this is a book that is not morally complex in terms of its viewpoint. It very much wants you to see the world as Layla sees it. But but Raphael, because you saw him in Savior's Champion, you know that he's a kind of okay person. And the, But the book doesn't really acknowledge that exactly. It's like the one case where it's kind of it is willing to let Layla's viewpoint be biased and let us know that it's biased, but it's not handled well. It's not graceful. It's odd, guys. I don't... A lot of the things that it tried to answer... I didn't necessarily like the answer. I don't like Brontes' plan. I don't like her plan. Her plan of just... We're going to pick off the senators one by one. Like, build a network yourself, Layla. Like, there are so many other ways you could have thwarted this or fought against it in ways that would have made so much more sense. Like, the minute she found out, Brontes was like, yeah, no, we're going to keep with your ruse. She should have been like, everybody, I'm the savior. Brontes was suddenly <laughs> okay with it. I should know it's it, it should not be okay. Now, granted, characters can make terrible decisions you know like they're in i'm gonna go back to shira there's a character named glimmer and glimmer makes a lot of bad decisions from a complicated emotional state that she's in and then she's redeemed but her decisions were depicted as bad decisions and outside of two moments where layla's like man nothing has gone the way i expected it to nobody else ever was like yeah no layla that was that was dumb she has no one around her to like really advise her there's two things i want to cover before we finish one is that i remember reading this i think in jenna Moresi's discord and i'm not positive i'm remembering it correctly but i'm just gonna say it and i because i think it's apocryphal of the way that she thinks about things she said at one point that you want drama and tension in a relationship but that too often that comes from abuse and that's one of the reasons that she markets these books as wholesome romance. And if you've seen them online, people love to say that about it, that it's a wholesome romance. And she says one of the best ways to do that is to have it be a forbidden love. Like that's a good way of building tension and drama in a healthy way. Without it being abusive. Right. But I think the thing is that that is such a flattening view of romance and how to use romance to tell a story. Some of the best romances I've read in fan fiction a lot of times because fan fiction is actually very good at doing this are more rich for the story they're telling of these people and the problems that they have and how they the friction between them creates like a frisson this is a little more sexual than i thought it would be there is an energy there in the ways that like they don't quite match up and they fight each other and it's like both of them have to go through a journey of learning they overcome yeah exactly you're not a perfect person and the thing is not all conflict in a relationship especially in literature, 
is abusive or unhealthy. And I think that that is one of the epitomes of this book's morally simplistic view, is that Layla and Tobias are really boring as a couple. Again, they're, they're not cute, but there's a lot of them doing cute things, which like, I guess if you like both of them, that'd be oh, nice, but oh I find it God. very grating. You reminded me of something. <laughs> the tonal whiplash in the second half of the book. Layla will kill a senator and then cuddle Tobias. Layla will discover that Cosima has betrayed her and then cuddled Tobias. Like, it's just these really weird shit's happening. Like, things, the ball's rolling as far as her discovering stuff's going downhill. And then she's just off canoodling Tobias. And Will's right. Their relationship is not very complex. I don't feel... They have similarities. Like, like Marassi did the work in the sense that she made them. Like, you know, they both like art. And they both like similar scroll stories. Also... Also, also, their fight scenes were so much worse the second time around. <laughs> um, also, Tobias's dialogue is better than Layla's. Tobias can be funny and like a smart ass and Layla's not. <laughs> like she's not as engaging dialogue wise. So to be in her head and have her dialogue at the same time was not as fun for me. I think also just to go back and talk about structure one more time. In Tobias's point of view, it kind of makes sense his cuddling punctuated with the challenges in the tournament because he doesn't actually have control of what's going on in the tournament they're set up whereas here she literally is just in life and death situations and then stops what she's doing to go cuddle tobias. to cuddle tobias and like she's in charge of the pace of what these events are but jenna already trapped herself by writing them in the first book yep. which you would think she would have thought of beforehand but. i don't know i just and i realize now like our savior's champion one was really funny <laughs> And I don't think, guys, that this is going to be as funny of a video, but I think it's because Savior's Champion was, for me, more readable. And, like, the stuff that happened, like, the, the things that I had issue with were funny, but this felt like, and this is why, this felt like a missed opportunity. There were so many things that could have been good, could have been complex, could have been nuanced and super interesting. Uh, Savior's Champion was exactly what it wanted to be. The Bachelor plus Survivor plus... Hunger Games. It did its thing. It was a bloody romance book. That was fine. This book, I think, is advertised, like Will said, as something political, as intrigue, as complexity. And it wasn't. And I just... I think in that way, it made it almost worse. Favorite Champion, it was what it was. You experienced it. You read it. It happened. But with this, I was like... Why did this person do that? That was a dumb reason. That, like, I knew why Tobias did stuff. You know, even if I didn't agree with it. It's actually hard to remember what happens in this book, even though it's my third time reading the events of the tournament, because it's sort of cluttered. And you're right, there's a joylessness to this. There is a sense that, like, she was writing out the backstory of her characters, and then she published it. Savior's Champion is a much simpler plot, and it plays to more of her strengths, which are, I mean strength in air quotes which is like there's a simple plot that moves from one side to the other this one is a more complex plot structurally speaking and one of those plots is a thing she's not good at writing which is politics and mystery she's not good at mystery i'm really glad the third book isn't out right now because my brain is broken from reading bad books at this point we've done a lot we did the three for those of you who haven't watched our recent output it was savior's champion which again in retrospect i think is infinitely better <laughs> this is enjoyability i enjoyed that book more than i enjoyed this book the other thing is if you cut about 30 percent of the savior's champion it becomes a much better book yeah it would just be much better if 30 percent of it was gone if you cut 30 percent of this book it wouldn't get better that's the thing about savior's champion is that like it's bad but it's not irrevocably bad i'm sorry guys i'm kind of sick right now <laughs> that's why i'm not making a lot of sense or pronouncing things correctly <laughs> but i'm here for this review i told maria if i die she has to review this on her own that's my last will and testament this the show must go on i'll do it guys no you're totally right the savior's champion is much simpler structurally and it's a much easier book to read yeah we read the savior's champion and then three ice planet barbarian books this book and we actually still have two more ice planet barbarian books with our mystery guest 
Oh, and I can't. We were reading um, Hyperion, which is a sci-fi novel oh, that Maria really likes. Yes. It's so weird reading something so good after this. It's bizarre. It's like if you tried to convince me that a cricket and an elephant were both uh, like mammals. It's bizarre that they belong even in the same mode of artistry, this book and Hyperion, because Hyperion is so much better. It's just, uh, it, it's infuriating on an existential level. I don't necessarily think, like, on an objective level, Save Your Sister is, like, that much worse than Savior's Champion, but it's not as fun. I felt like Savior's Champion, for as much as we made fun of it the first time, didn't take itself as seriously as this book takes itself. It's true. There's there's more energy to Savior's Champion. There's much more like, I'm just writing a thing that I like. And in this, it's like, I'm writing the backstory to characters, but you don't feel that Jenna really likes this. Yeah. I'm sure we'll do the third one when it comes out because I don't, it's not going to be out anytime soon. it'll be soon. very long from now. Because after after we do the second, the la- the four and five of the Ice Planet Barbarians, I told Will, I'm done. I, most, of we'll the videos, do good books. most of the videos on our channel is us reading books that we actually like and engage with and have a lot of like, this is not the norm, and I don't want it to be. The videos where we're roasting books are the ones that are doing really well and bringing us in a lot of viewers. Please go watch the other videos and like them and comment them so you <laughs> give me a reason to read good books that I enjoy. Because, like, I don't want to just read things that I don't like. Please, support us, guys. We're Also, can I just say that between this book and uh, this movie, this, oh, God, between this video and the last one where we talked about our, like, what, were we at, like, 100 subscribers? At the I last- think we were at, like, 30 on Dune, when we did Dune Messiah or something insane. Guys, we're, like, what number are we at? Right now, as of filming this, and today is the fifth, uh, we're on 500. I probably won't release this for another week. What? Guys, that's insane. Crazy. We have, we have really, there's been some growth. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for interacting and liking and commenting and stuff, but go watch the other ones. <laughs> please. <laughs> so leave, leave some books in the comments that you want us to read that are good because yes. a lot of people love books that are bad. They want us to roast books. We'll roast more books. Like I think if we did like one a month or something like that, that That'd would be, be good. Fun. But please recommend us some books that you think are good and you would like us yeah, to. Yeah, that you like, that you want to share. I want to read things that I've never read before that people think are good. I need to heal my soul a little please bit. Please, give us books you think would heal our soul. That's what I want from you guys. That's give a us good, books yeah. that you love, not books that you hate and you want to watch us hate them. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fine. We'll do that too. But also give us books you love, guys. Give us books you love. All right. I think that's going to be it for us. Hopefully this made some kind of sense. I just, I, I don't know why the plot just didn't come to me for this one. Scenes don't motivate things that happen in other scenes. So there's not a causal link. There really isn't. A doesn't lead to B to C to D. It's A, D, K, C, E. And you're like, okay, but what do those have to do with each other? Yeah. I don't think that made sense. Um, did, thank you, no viewers. Way. Parasocial relationships. I love you. I love you, my parasocial darlings.